301, so we will get started with our Tempo Talks webinar. Uh, happy that you are joining us, spending your Friday afternoon with us before you kick off your weekend. Before we get started, I just do need to acknowledge how heavy this week has been for a lot of people, specifically people of color. So we at Tempo want everyone to know that we stand with you, we are thinking of you, and we are doing what we can to be better allies. So just had to say that before we get started. So first, a few housekeeping items about our Tempo Talks. If this is your first time joining us, our Tempo Talks are a weekly webinar series that we started back in April, with the purpose really being to highlight our Tempo Milwaukee members and experts on different topics to help you run your business, manage your team, and stay on top of the latest trends. So we have been doing them every single Friday uh, since the beginning of April, 3 to 4 p.m. Next week and for the summer months, we will switch to noon, noon to 1 p.m. So hopefully that um, makes the chances better that you can join us, gives you some flexibility. Um, but please, we hope that you continue to tune in. Lastly, before I introduce our panelists, just a couple of pointers about Zoom. I'm sure you probably don't need them anymore, but um, since this is a webinar format, all of our attendees are muted, videos are disabled, don't need to worry about accidentally turning on your camera, but we do really encourage you to use the Q&A box or the chat function to send in any questions or really just say what's on your mind. That has been really my favorite part of Zoom webinars is that chat function and getting to hear from people um, that I haven't talked to in so long. So let's get started. Today's panelists, which I am thrilled to introduce and I welcome you guys to turn on your videos after I introduce you. So first I'm going to introduce Jody Gibson. Jody is the president and CEO of the Zoological Society of Milwaukee, and she joined Tempo in 2017. Jody has a unique background, having held senior leadership positions in both the corporate and nonprofit sectors. Previously, she served as VP of Corporate Social Responsibility at two Fortune 200 companies, including Kellogg Company and JCPenney. Earlier in her career, she was a member of the man management team at the National Office of Feeding America, where she led fundraising and other external affairs activities. Born in Milwaukee and a graduate of Ripon College, she is committed to doing her part to make our community a great place to live, work, and play. Welcome, Jody. Hi, Jody. Next, I am going to introduce Ms. Sarah Mayo. Sarah Mayo serves as the VP of Marketing and Communications for the Wisconsin Center, UW-Milwaukee Panther Arena and Miller High Life Theater. Since joining the Wisconsin Center District in 2016, Mayo has developed the organization's marketing and communications department, including redesigning the venue's websites for an enhanced customer experience, developing long-term strategic communications plans, crafting and executing an internal branding and culture campaign, and expanding WCD's visibility locally and nationally. Sarah joined Tempo in 2019. And what she did not include in her bio is she has four children under the age of 12. So welcome, Sarah. That should have been the first line of your bio. <laughs> I'll rewrite it next time. Yes. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, Peggy Williams-Smith, President and CEO of Visit Milwaukee. Peggy started her career with Marcus Hotels and Resorts in 1997 and held various positions throughout the company. In her latest role with Marcus, she served as SVP for Marcus Hotels growth of the Safe House Restaurant Group. In November 2019, Peggy assumed her current role at Visit Milwaukee, the city's visitors and convention bureau. Peggy was selected from a national field of 100 candidates and is the first woman to lead the organization. Yay, yay Peggy. She has been a Temple member since 2006 and is also a past president of Temple. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. 
Uh, we know you are more than busy right now keeping up with running your businesses. I think Peggy's on a webinar every single day, if not two a day. So thank you. And we'll get into our discussion on the future of gathering. If you want to stop sharing the PowerPoint, Kelsey. Thank you. Thank goodness, because I have the same exact shirt on that I had on in the picture. <laughs> Sorry. This is my first time dressing up in several weeks. So I want to thank you guys for that. So let's get into our questions. Our topic is the future of gathering. Each of you have very unique perspectives to offer about what it will look like for your businesses. We've got the zoo, we've got multiple venues that Sarah um, is part of, and then in a general sense, tourism for the city of Milwaukee. So then we'll get into some questions about what can we still look forward to this summer, although it seems everything is canceled. So I want to get started with just learning about the state of things for each of your organizations. So Jody, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what is, what's going on at the zoo right now? Sure. Well, just to tell you a little bit about the zoo, um, because I know people often care about the um, most about our animals and certainly our, our staff and the people. Um, even though the zoo is closed to the public, our zookeepers are hard at work um, providing the very best care to all of the animals um, in our collection. So um, the animals are doing very, very well. Um, they miss the guests and the activity um, that's out at the zoo, um, but they and they look forward to the day uh, when we can all reopen. Um, so I think, you know, overall, we may have the potential to weather this storm a little bit better than most as an outdoor venue um, that has a higher probability of opening sooner rather than later. Um, but as you might imagine, we rely heavily on earned income and selling um, all access passes to visit the zoo. So it's definitely a challenging time um, financially. Um, um, we've prepared for rainy days, so um, we're managing this effectively, but certainly the sooner we can safely reopen um, would be good for all of us. So um, we're, we are hopeful um, that we will be able to open sooner rather than later following the model of parks and, and golf courses um, that are already um, open to the public. What is it like if one were to go to the zoo right now? Are the animals out in their regular? Yes. <laughs> Are they loving it? Are they? Yeah, you know, I was just out there and, you know, I, that's a great question. People often ask me, what do I love most about my job? And when the zoo is open, I love the very beginning and end of the day. Um, the beginning of the day, because typically when we're open, you can feel the excitement of moms, dads, kids, schools that all want to come and enjoy the zoo. Um, one of my other favorite parts of the day though is the very end um, because I'm often there after the zoo closes. So to have had the chance at the end of a business day or right now while we're closed to walk around and just really enjoy the majesty of the animals and really take that in and feel connected to nature, um, it's really, it, it's kind of extraordinary. So it's a, it's a bittersweet uh, time um, for the staff because we get to experience that, um, but our joy comes from sharing all of that with our community at large. Definitely is a Milwaukee gem that we all miss. Sarah, I'm going to move to you. Same question. What is the status of things right now at the Wisconsin Center District between all your venues? What does your day-to-day -day look like? Tell us about that. This has been, um, it's been quite a, a last four months for us. Um, right before the tidal wave of COVID hit our industry and, and all of our lives, um, we had just secured from our board approval for a gorgeous expansion of the Wisconsin Center. So we were um, we were riding high, and it was and it was great, and it was um, exciting, and and that has been so fulfilling to carry us through these these challenges because we know that there is a really bright light at the end of the tunnel for this. Um, you know, the 90 days that followed that have been really a roller coaster of making sure that our clients. Are taken care of and that they know that when they're ready to come back we are ready to welcome them 
our business is, is gathering and to be in a business expecting and preparing for people right now is a little tricky. So um, we are spending a lot of time as a senior team listening. We're paying attention to authorities. We're paying attention to science. We're paying attention to government officials. And we want to make sure that when we reopen, it is absolutely with all of our guests and our employees safety top of mind um, we're being really careful about it and taking steps methodically and appropriately um, so I, I think to be in the business of live events and have none is it, like it hurts your soul um, but but we we have a light at the end of the tunnel and it's really I'm so grateful for it because we we have this to carry us through um, and and reinforce that there is, there is certainly hope and it will be awesome when we get back to it. So to clarify, the expansion still is moving forward? Yeah, so um, okay. the, right now the uh, board has approved um, our, or has authorized us to secure funding. We have not secured it yet, obviously due to market conditions. So being careful and mindful about that. But when it is time, um, we will need one more approval and uh, off we go. So the render, I mean, the renderings are done. They're on buildingmore.com. Um, it's going to be really exciting. And if, if nothing else, the, what we've taken from the last 90 days is just the opportunity to think carefully about, about how we build this building. What is the future of gathering and how do we make sure that Milwaukee is appropriately prepared to stand out from the pack? Really good point. Really good point. Peggy PWS. I'm going to move to you. So what are the, what's the state of things that visit Milwaukee? What are you working on? What are your focuses now? Well, the state of things right now in my house is that my 17 year old just came home not realizing I was on a call and my dog went nuts. So all of you just heard Tito. Um, you know, right now things, the state of the, the state of things for visit Milwaukee, which is really tourism for the city is, is bad. We're an organization that's responsible for selling and marketing the city and, and no one's traveling right now. There's no revenues coming in. You know, obviously personally for Visit Milwaukee, we've cut staff, we've cut benefits, we're working remotely. We have to make fast decisions that have real impact on people's lives. And it's, it's, it's daunting. You know, just to give you an example of what the state of the hotel industry, which drives tourism throughout our, our region, is that in April, our STAR report, which is the indicator for how well hotels are doing, in 2019, in the month of April, we did $15 million in revenue in the city. And in 2020, we did $1 million. That's a 93.2% drop in revenue. For the county last year, we did $27 million. And this year we did 4 million, and that's an 83% um, drop and most of those hotels were limited service. There's a lot of construction going on for us personally at visit. We've adapted our purpose right now to help to um, start helping locals and those in the hospitality industry by providing employment resources, organizing hotels to offer special first responder and frontline worker rates for anyone who doesn't want to bring the virus home to their family. We're providing anti discrimination information travel research and resources. Um, one thing that I really like is the page that we've dedicated to the good things brewing um, in Milwaukee, which tells you about how some of our restaurants have become soup kitchens, our manufacturers that are making PPE and distilleries that are making sanitizer, which we just had to buy a whole bunch from because we're going to start opening our offices next week. So, you know, that's what we've been focused on right now, but it truly is, it is just something that we've never experienced before. And then having come into this role about six months and 11 days ago into what was supposed to be the year of Milwaukee. I mean, we were supposed to be, you know, 35 days away from welcoming the DNC, which is still happening by the way, in person is still happening. Um, you know, we, we, it's just, everything has changed. I'm just going to ask that question because I know it will come in the Q&A is what can you tell us about the DNC right now? I mean, we still work with the DNC. I actually just got off a call with them. They are working towards an in-person convention. We don't know what that will look like. It would be foolish for us to 
say what it looks like now and then all of a sudden something happens two weeks from now. So they are working hard as we are on every single aspect of what this could look like and then how we would react to make sure Milwaukee still has a part of that global stage. And I know Sarah is also working on it because Wisconsin Center District's very involved with what they're doing, but they are certainly moving forward with plans. Sarah, do you have anything you wanna say about that? I think Peggy embodied it perfectly. It just, we are all very aware that it is um, fluid and, and that is a word that we have used a lot lately and it's, um, it's rolling off my tongue a little too easily. Um, and it, we're just paying close attention and making sure that when the plans are ready, so are we. Fluid and pivot, those are the two words of 2020. Hello. <laughs> Um, so next question is, where are you getting that guidance and recommendations and information? I'm sure a lot of people are coming to you thinking you're the experts in, you know, how to reopen a big venue, but where are you getting the recommendations from about hand sanitizer, plexiglass, spacing, all of those things? I'll start with Jody. Sure. Well, probably like most people on the call, we've tapped into whether it's federal resources through the CDC and the guidance to make sure we are following the very best um, science that's available to things offered by the state from the Badger Bounce Back program, um, as well as local resources. Our friends at MMAC, I think, have done a great job of bringing resources together and marrying um, the, the medical science with the pragmatic issues of opening the economy. Um, and then we take advantage of our associates Associations, the associations of zoos and aquariums, the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. And by the time you digest and distill all of that information, the trends and best practices really become pretty clear. Um, and we're able to apply a lot of those to what we're doing. And I would just add at our organization, and I imagine like many others, um, as we took that information in, I also gave guidance to our team to look at what we could do to open with a focus on uh, visitor safety and staff safety. And I, I took the burden of worrying about dollars and cents off of them and said, you go figure out the safest way for us to open. And then a smaller group of myself and our senior leadership team will look at the dollars and cents and find a way to fund the appropriate way to open it. So we really tried to remove any, um, uh, any of the cost burdens that people might feel so we could put um, safety first and really use all of the information um, from all of those sources to help us with our plan. Is there anything special you have to consider with animals being involved? It's not like you can go touch an animal in yeah. times, but do you have any special considerations you have to think about? So um, yes, so thank you for asking um, because um, we are going to follow some guidance uh, similar to what's promoted by um, MMAC and to think about this not like a light switch that's on and off, closed yesterday, fully open today. We really are looking at that moderated approach where it's more of a dial and there are special considerations. So when people come out to the zoo for the first time when we reopen, during the first phase, the build Buildings will be closed. So guests will have access to all of the outdoor spaces, but to um, adjust to the new normal and kind of moderate our behavior, a lot of the buildings will be closed. Then eventually those will reopen, but we'll probably still keep the primates and the big cats um, buildings closed for a period of time because you may have seen there was a case of COVID-19 and some tigers um, at a zoo out in the Bronx. So um, there's particular species where we need and want to be more careful and we will slowly um, reopen, uh, reopen that. So looking out for the safety of the guests, um, our staff, as well as all of the animals um, definitely is at the forefront of our plans and we're going to step into it one step at a time. Yeah, so unique to have to think about animals too. Thanks for sharing. Sarah, what about you? Where are you guys getting your guidance from? I've seen photos of, you know, movie theaters where they remove the seats. Are you guys looking at anything like that? Tell us about 
the status of things. Yeah, we, we have so many variables to think about and to contend with um, because we have three very unique facilities. And so for the Wisconsin Center, we've really been working a lot with IABM, uh, venue management, and making sure that we are working with them and with our peers across the country to create standards that are manageable. And like Jody said, you know, really turning the dial and not just flipping from on to off. Um, almost all of our staff has been working from home through, through the last 12 weeks. Um, a few folks have been you know, needing to go in because the buildings do need maintenance and care. But um, we are starting to think about that phased approach and bringing back some of the admin staff and how does that look and feel. And then really getting into um, the future of the, of the convention clients and how do we make sure that we are keeping things not just clean and sanitized, but promoting and, and letting our clients know information to share with their guests so that there is just a, um, a base level comfort and just a clear understanding of what is or isn't happening throughout the building. Um, for the Miller High Life Theater and the UW-Milwaukee Panther Arena, with seats, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us with how to keep the seats sanitized. Um, there are certainly lots of unique tools and um, products that are out there and available to us. So again, you know, to Jody's point, looking at those um, from one perspective of efficiency and effectiveness and then following up with how are we gonna make that work? Um, and then, you know, the unique challenges that come with having two big seated venues is when we get back into live event business, how does it look? How does it feel? Um, and in the Wisconsin Center, what, is an, what does an, an event in the Expo Hall look and feel like to make sure that folks are, are safe? And um, you know, it's for out of town guests, it's for our staff, it's for everyone. Hey, what about you? You don't have a physical space besides your office, but what are you thinking about in terms of tourism back to the city and who's giving you guidance? Well, I sit on a zillion webinars a day, listening to experts from all over the country and all over the world. I'm a part of three different task forces, which allow me to hear from not only association planners, corporate planners, as well as other heads of destination management organizations, as well as other venue operators throughout the country. So what we're really trying to do is be a resource by putting as much information as we can so that people can take that and then put their best um, foot forward in trying to reopen safely as we are able to reopen safely. So that comes, that could be uh, someone as small as a teeny tiny little wedding venue who wants to know when they can start having weddings of 50 and how are they rearranging their space or their diagrams to make sure that they can accommodate people to come in safely. That's really what we've been focused on. Even just doing it for yourselves, reopening the office on Monday, we closed our offices at two o'clock today. They're not open, I've been going in, but I had to be out by two because they're gonna be sanitized so that when we start phasing people back in and we're gonna start with a limit of 10 people, that they know that everything has been wiped completely clean, but we walked through and there were 10 changes that one of my managers and I made today because as we walked through and used the hand sanitizer and then used the copy machine, we're like, oh, we need to put gloves there because we can't use the, the Windex or the, you know, the, the Clorox wipes. So I think that, you know, I, the, the best advice I can give to anyone is that you need to remain very much open and being fluid because things are going to change as soon as people start getting out there and you're going to have to pivot and make those changes immediately. Thanks, Peggy. And I know you, we talked in a previous webinar about this, but what is your prediction for tourism? You talked about, you know, it'll probably be more of a regional approach. Oh, sure. Well, you know, the first thing that'll come back is leisure. And we are getting some positive survey results coming back that are saying that people will want to start traveling again, barring obviously another outbreak in September and, and October. So I'm, I'm hopeful and we're well positioned because they are also saying that they're changing their plans, that they would be driving 
versus flying. You know, eventually they'll get to flying and, and the flights are getting more and more full each day, but um, we, are, we are positioned within a six hour driving distance of a third of the population, which does make us um, very easy, easy to come to for those leisure travel, travel people. So, and then we just have so much to do that is considered what people would think is safe for those leisure travel destinations, vacations. So I think that that's what we're focusing on. We're gonna start our, our marketing campaign, just getting it out there, how safe and how attractive we are as a destination, probably in the next two weeks, just so that people understand that as soon as it's safe to do so, we are ready to welcome them. Thank you. I'm gonna shift back to Jody now. So Zoological Society, is a nonprofit organization, correct? Yes. So you're still, you're still needing to raise money. Is there any strategies you've used to talk with donors? How have you had to shift your efforts in that way? Yeah, well, and, and thank you for the question too, that um, just so people are aware, the Zoological Society of Milwaukee is a nonprofit charity partner that helps support the Milwaukee County Zoo. So to the outside world, it's just the zoo, um, but the zoo itself is operated by the county. Um, we help raise funds to help support the zoo, but we also run all the zoo classes and camps um, that people know and love for their kids and run um, conservation initiatives. So we're more than just a fundraising arm, but fundraising absolutely is central to what we do. And, you know, as I was looking at the data, I would say that we've got a story that's the glass is half full. Um, and so we are fortunate to be able to see a number of our um, donors and supporters recognize that even though we're closed, um, we still have work to do um, to support the zoo as well as our own operations and then prepare for the new normal. So we did, like many others, see a significant drop in things like the sales of Zoo Pass, which is the membership um, program. It, you know, it's hard to sell an all access pass to the zoo when the zoo is closed. Um, but we've actually seen about 30 to 50% of our members renew them on a monthly basis. So that's why I say it's half full. A 50% drop in your biggest revenue stream is huge. Um, so we cannot underestimate that. And I don't want to sugarcoat it. But I do want to acknowledge that people know and, and love the, the, the zoo and want to support it. So there's 50% that 30 to 50% in any given month um, that are coming back and helping to support our operations. Um, and then what I would share is we're fortunate to have a great development team that's on the phone. So now that all of us are at home, um, sometimes it's a little easier to catch um, some individuals um, and people are continuing to make gifts and support our efforts. Um, they're kind of doing a little bit of a wait and see and as you would expect and even I would expect, um, people are looking out for those social services like hunger relief and the fundamentals um, are certainly should be at the top of people's list. But what we've heard from people is as things start to come back, um, we continue to be a priority. But it has been um, it has been a challenge, and I just feel blessed to be in that spot where it's you know half full um, because it could be much more challenging, um, and and that gives me hope of what will happen when we reopen. Um, if we're able to hold on to half of our guests now. I think when we reopen, fingers crossed, um, we'll see people come back to us. Thanks, Jody. Is there any talk of, or maybe you're already doing this and I'm not aware, virtual experiences at the zoo, like live feeds? And yeah, so that's a great question. We've been doing a combination of things, whether it's on the Facebook pages for the zoo or the society or our website. So anything from uh, what we would call keeper talks, where you can hear from the zookeepers and see um, and learn what uh, is going on with the different animals, to our educators giving um, projects and translating their curriculum into things moms and dads can do um, at home with their kids. So. 
we've got a wide array of offerings and then I'm also pleased to share um, we just received a grant for a unique partnership with Alaska Sea Life to do distance learning um, that was in that was underway in advance of COVID-19 but it makes it all, all the more relevant um, because well that, that will not only be a unique partnership where we can bring programming from Alaska to to kids in our community but the grant will also fund some of the equipment we need to enhance our capabilities to do virtual learning so um, a lot of exciting things on the on the horizon as we build out that capability within our organization that is super exciting so glass half full love yes <laughs> glass half full Sarah, has the WCD done any virtual events or any different revenue generating streams you're looking at? Absolutely. What we're really focusing in on now is how do we welcome back the clients who are ready to be back and in person, but also expect that some of their groups will not be ready. So we're zeroing in and focusing on what virtual capabilities do we already have and how do we make them even more efficient so that an, an event can be held simultaneously live and virtually and give the event goers the same experience. And for those who either can't travel or are not confident enough to travel, they still want to participate. I mean, I think the big thing that we've all seen in terms of gathering is the dramatic um, impact of isolation and how challenging it is to be away from each other. I, like Jody, I am very hopeful for the future. I do not wish to sugarcoat the next six or nine months. It's going to be uh, a, a challenge that we don't even know yet what will happen. Um, but so too do I feel extremely confident that the folks and the, the way that people are working right now, it will really just raise the bar and give uh, people like Peggy and Jody and organizations like Visit in the Zoo, a, a chance at growing in kind of an exponential leap, not just, um, you know, the growth that we expect year over year, but really exponential and providing the kind of spaces and opportunities for folks that um, will be really unique and meaningful and, and, and will really chart the future of how we get together. Yeah, so true. And you just have to think of the spectrum of how comfortable people will even be going out in the future. So really trying to cater to all of the needs. We're thinking about those things at Tempo too, as an organization that puts on 40 events a year. Right. We're all thinking about it. Right. We had a question come in that I'm going to ask to Peggy. Um, and it's with all the new safety protocols being put in place, will we see an increase in costs? For example, ticket prices, food and beverage, hotel room rates, rental fees. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, definitely, yes. You're going to see price increases. You know, I think that some of the things I'm seeing on questionnaires that are being put out to hotel partners is how many extra people are you going to have cleaning public spaces? You know, if you've ever been to a nice hotel in the past, you don't see the people cleaning because they wanted it that way. Now they're going to want to see the person who's walking in the bathroom, making sure that it's cleaned after every use, making sure that, you know, you see all this, all this stuff. So I definitely think Think there's going to be price increases with hotels it's not as easy to see because there isn't a static price that you see um, you know it was interesting I was asked a question by a local journalist where someone responded to all and the question was about um, masks and there was a, a salon that is charging a PPE fee because they're requiring you to wear a mask when you walk in and then they're charging you a fee for all the PPE equipment that they had to purchase. So, you know, I think that it's going to be much like if you remember, well, some of you would remember, some of you aren't old enough to remember, but when we had the last recession, everyone put a surcharge for trucks because gas prices had gone so high and there were all these different charges that we tried to charge. And then pretty soon they had to be dialed back because the government said that they weren't legal, I think you're going to see it at first and then it eventually will get rolled back because people are just going to want to be busy and they're going to start competing with each other. Sarah or Jody, any thoughts from your perspectives on price increases? 
You know, for us, um, we have always been, and as far as our clients go, it's been um, always on a case by case basis. Um, I will say, I think that, uh, you know, the box lunch is about to have a big moment. So there, <laughs> there will be, you know, ways that we can ebb and flow. And um, we are always, always mindful of the client's overall budget. Um, and I just, I just don't, I think there's a little too much cosmic dust still floating around for us to make um, broad declarative statements one way or the other. Um, but we get it. I mean, it's, it, we want people to be in the building safely. We want people to enjoy the city and feel comfortable in the city. And um, we will absolutely bend over backwards to make it happen. And I think you captured that perfectly. I mean, I think all of us have to look at what it actually costs to operate our business and find ways to share those costs. Um, at the same time, we're committed to making sure we're accessible to the broader community, and that's something people expect of us, too. So to the degree we can, um, we may choose um, other uh, ways to um, identify and get the revenue that we need to offset some of those um, costs. So um, it, it's probably too early to tell what that might look like, um, but I think we're committed to being accessible to our community, um, and that would be our first choice. Another question has come in too, love it. So keep it coming, attendees. Uh, I'm gonna direct this one to Sarah, our marketing guru. Um, it's the, the question is, live experience is really part of the brand for many industries surrounding gatherings. Do you consider virtual options to be helpful or detrimental to the brand and how? Great question. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes and yes. You know, um, I, I think, uh, back to my sentiment earlier that one thing that has been revealed in my opinion in the last 90 or 100 days is just people's need to be with people um and i think for now a virtual event is a really um sensible way to dip your toe back in the water and but so too do i feel i mean the people who are listening right now we're doing this virtually and it's and it's great to be part of this and to be able to have engagement with folks but at the same time it's not the same as being in the same room so i i think we will probably forevermore need to have virtual options available to us and just make that part of the expectation that it will exist um but so too do i believe that it is not uh it's not enough to feed to feed humanity, um, that we will need to eventually want to come back together with each other, um, and and I think I think it's a great uh, bridge to get to to get to there for now. Yeah, I'm definitely thankful for the option to have it. Peggy, Jody, do you care to weigh in on that question? Well, I, I mean, I 100% agree. There, there's, there's no substitution. I can't see any of the attendees' faces right now. The one thing is that you don't have to tell everyone to be quiet when you start your speech, but it is not the same having this type of interaction and you don't create the same connections that you would in person. And I think that that will, as soon as it is able, obviously this is a necessity. We did a um, seminar on virtual events for, um, visit Milwaukee and someone sent something to me saying, why would you promote virtual events? And I said, in no way, shape or form do I want virtual events to supersede in-person events, but right now we can't meet in person. So we do need to meet this way. And as we can come out of this safely, we will need to meet again so that we can talk and forge those relationships moving forward. And I would build on that too, because I, I, I completely agree people want to get together. Um, what I hope happens though is that we look at some of these virtual activities as companion pieces that might extend our reach um, or make some things accessible that might not be accessible. So when I look at things like um, Zoo Ball is one of our largest fundraising events, that's a high ticket black tie affair um, that I imagine a lot of people might want to support, but the price point might not allow for the night out that's involved with the black tie gala. But I bet people might want 
want to join us on the appeal or the silent auction. So um, I hope we don't get to an either or. We might be able to have several hundred people on site and maybe a few hundred more online. Um, and wouldn't that be a nice, you know, win-win? So um, to the degree we can look at these things as compatible rather than competing, um, I think that might help us in the long run. Yeah, and I did, I did see a question from Vicki. Hi, Vicki. Um, just from a tempo standpoint, a question about what we're doing. And I'll first just, you know, address the virtual component is our members were, were requesting virtual for years for programs to be recorded because they couldn't get downtown for meetings. And it will, really was this pandemic that forced us to give that option. And we're seeing members engage who just could not make anything in person, but now they can. So I think we really do want to merge, someone rang the doorbell. Uh, we want to merge virtual into whatever we do in the future. And Vicki also wanted to know about, you know, when are we looking to be in person? Fortunately, we already had our golf outing planned. So that is August 10th for our members and Emerging Women Leaders. It will look a little bit different this year, but we're really excited for that opportunity to see people from a distance. Uh, for the rest of 2020, I think we're honestly planning on virtual. If things change and we can go to in-person, that would be great. But we are working on our largest event of the year, the leadership event in October, and we're actually working alongside Sarah and her team on the latest recommendations. So hope that answered your question, Vicki. I do wanna move into the other half of our content. I know we still have some questions coming in and hopefully we can get to them, but about Milwaukee summer, we all, we wait all year for this, for the nice weather, for the festivals. I think we're all a little bit bummed out that our favorite things are canceled, but Give us some positive news. What are you guys looking forward to? Are there any unique things that you've heard about that families can do? I'll start with Sarah. You're, you're so right. I mean, to, to lose festivals in the city of festivals is like a dagger in your soul, um, especially with the state fair news. But I, I have to say, I, I applaud all those decisions they are the, it's the brave thing to do. And it's scary and it's intimidating and, and people will have a lot of strong feedback about it. Um, but it, it's the brave thing to do. And it just already makes me feel more excited for, for when we can get back together. Um, that said, you know, per, per your bio point, uh, I am a mom of four and the kids all have activities and things to do, which is, really important to keep their their mental health engaged um, but at the same time to be looking ahead at a summer where we maybe can just kind of give ourselves a little bit more grace and a little bit of pause and and a little bit of still um, i'm looking forward to that for for the family and for them um, you know they are out on their bikes right now all day every day or you know when they're done with their work they just disappear and like that is that's the way to be a kid and as much as festivals are um part of our dna and i love them um we also have some phenomenal natural resources and assets that are available to us that we might not get to check out otherwise or make time for um, and here comes the <laughs> here comes my zoo um it, it's going to be, you know, weird, but I think for us, you know, we'll have a lot of campfires. We're going to take a lot of trail walks. We're going to ride our bikes and uh, we're going to try to manage a three-year-old. <laughs> you know, Milwaukee has 15,000 acres of parkland, 1,400 acres of beaches, three recreational rivers, outdoor gardens, nature centers, 75 golf courses within an hour's drive of Milwaukee. There is so many things to experience this summer, even though there won't be festivals there, you know, we are, as Sarah said, all sad. 
that State Fair had to cancel, but it was the smart thing to do. They, they spent so much time looking at different models. I spoke with Kathleen O'Leary on a regular basis and she was just beside herself trying to figure out a way to hold State Fair safely and it just wasn't going to be a possibility. So we just need to make sure that we're looking at all of those natural resources that we have here in the city and the surrounding region because there is so much for us to still do. Sculpture Milwaukee is still happening. We're gonna have an outdoor museum that can also drive visitors from maybe an hour or two or from the suburbs in to take a look at that. And, and you know, I think as we move forward and things do start to open up, we'll see other things that will start to take place maybe naturally as well. And I'm going to take a moment for some seamless promotion of the zoo um, at the moment, but in part um, because we've been working on a multi-year, multi-million dollar um, project and renovations out at the zoo. So you might be familiar um, together with the zoo, the society um, has partnered with the county. We are 50-50 partners on an um, Adventure Africa renovation and last year uh, and last summer we opened a brand new elephant care center and also welcomed another elephant out to the zoo and if you haven't been to see it it's really best in class and really um, phenomenal and I have a chance to get um, even closer than you were before um, and then we had planned and we finished a project on time and on budget uh, for a brand new underwater hippo exhibit um, at the zoo and and we are only the the 12th um, in, in the country um, to be able to have an exhibit like that. So many people fell in love with uh, baby Fiona from the Cleveland Zoo and their underwater exhibit. That's the kind of um, experience that we will be able to unveil to the public. Uh, we had intended to do that grand opening on June 13th, so we're kind of holding our breath <laughs> um, as to whether or not it'll happen then, but um, it will be there whenever the zoo is open. The project is complete and, and it's phenomenal. Um, and as Peggy noted, there's 200 acres of open space um, right out at the zoo to join too. So please take advantage of all the great things our city has to offer. I couldn't resist a little uh, shameless promotion. So thank you to all the panelists for me allowing, allowing me to do that. You should, Jody. that's amazing. <laughs> so Jody, related to that, you said June 13th. Is there an opening date you have in mind for the zoo? Can you not share that with us? We got a question in saying, you're seeing August events start to get canceled. Yeah, so we are, um, one of the things I love about our culture is we are eternally optimistic. <laughs> um, and, and what I would say to you is um, we have gone through many of the hurdles that would allow for our reopening when the city ordinance allows for it. So really what we are waiting for is that green light um, that would need to come from the city of Milwaukee. Um, the zoo and the society have prepared um, all of their written plans that are required. Um, they've gone through an initial review um, through the um, Office of um, Emergency management at the county um, and uh, we are poised and ready for um, when there might be a shift um, in that ordinance so that the hard part is that parts out of our control um, the things that are in our control like getting ready a thorough plan all of that you know we could be ready in short order to open the zoo once the ordinance um, allows for it and to open it safely um, in a very moderated and careful way um, with a little bit less attendance to step into this, um, time tickets and things um, where we could ensure people's safety. So we are ready um, for when that gets lifted. So what I would say is when you hear the ordinance lifted, watch our Facebook and other social media feeds. We'll probably be able to let people know um, when that could happen, but, but it, it, it would be near that date um, because we are ready for a safe reopening. Thanks. Really helpful. I want to ask Sarah the same question because you guys deal with booking talent, selling tickets. Are you doing any of that right now? How far out are you looking? Yes, yes. We're, we're talking every day with all of our promoter partners. Um, 
Some of them are small, some of them are large, some of them are international. And really at this point, you, we're, we're seeing and feeling a lot of the same things from the entertainment side, which is really artist driven. You know, I mean, there is a lot of risk in this environment for an artist to hit the road. Um, and, and they are not comfortable doing that and we get it. So um, at this point, we, we are all deeply engaged daily, weekly, with a lot of conversations um, with groups like Live Nation who are in charge of thousands of talent, um, bands, individuals, solo artists, and really working to make sure that everyone is safe, everyone is comfortable, um, and we, we just have to sort of roll with it and, and um, take a minute to just let it come to us. Um, you know, we can't force, nor would we force an artist on stage. And even if we did, how do we manage the, the audience and the crowd? And that's where our associations with uh, like venues in the city and then national and international groups like Live Nation or IAVM really, really is such um, an important and critical touchstone for us to make sure that we are not making these decisions unilaterally. We are using information that is current and that we're doing it in a really responsible way to keep everyone safe. Thanks, Sarah. Peggy, what are you hearing about reopening? You go to so many events. What's on your calendar for in-person versus not right now? Right now, there's nothing for in-person and the mayor just spoke. So I just got word that order number two is staying in place. No bars or restaurants opening and no gatherings of more than 10. And from what my people are saying, there's no end date to it. So, you know, we're really waiting to get guidance of when any of that can happen. I will tell you from a city standpoint, we do still have events that are booked that are moving forward to happen in person at this point. Obviously that would change if they're safely, if they're told they can't safely meet. We do have something with the Wisconsin Center District at the end of July. We have 210 teams signed up to take place in that tournament. Um, we have USA Triathlon, which is still actively pursuing holding the triathlon here in Milwaukee that first um, weekend in August. And then of course we have the DNC. So um, as far as, you know, the numerous charity fundraisers and all of those things, I, you know, the first one that I can think of that's actually been rescheduled that I'd be attending is the Urban League, the black and white ball. Um, I think people are, are still, and I, th I don't think that's until November. I think people are still waiting to see what's going to happen before they start making those plans. And I really have to say that our, our, venues in the city have been so accommodating because we have to remember that these are businesses that also employ people and they've been so accommodating to make sure that they are working with these groups to rebook them into future months into future years and and every time they do that they're they're taking away a part of how they can support the teams that work for them as well yeah, breaking news. Thanks for... Yeah, <laughs> that's why I grabbed my phone. I saw Kristen sending me text messages. Yeah, always on top of it. So the title of this webinar was The Future of Gathering. So I have another way that I want to ask that, which I actually saw from a panelist a couple of weeks ago, Anna Oaks. So instead of asking, you know, what do you think about the future? It's kind of two questions. So what do you know about the future of gathering? And what do you hope about the future of gathering? So I'm going to start with Joey. So I, I think what I what I would share that we we know again going in what you can control and what you can't is it it really occurred to me that it's really going to take each and every person. Um, to allow for that to happen, meaning we as leaders um, can set the tone, identify what's right for our organizations, put systems in place. Um, but given the nature of the pandemic, every citizen participates in that. So we all have to make smart choices. We have to put smart plans in place for our institutions, but then we need that to be reciprocated and have the community and our guests 
um, follow what we know to be those safe best practices. Um, so I think the degree to which we can communicate um, the shared responsibility that uh, comes with the reopening to encourage that responsible, moderated approach to the reopening, um, the better off we are. So um, what I don't know though tied to that, and maybe we can all work together on is, how do we instill that and create that culture across um, a community as um, expansive, diverse um, as ours and make sure we get the message out there? Because I, I really do think it's gonna take all of us um, making smart decisions about our behaviors um, that will allow for that. Because going back to that dial example, if we step into this and do it well, then we're willing to take another step and go a little further into that reopening. Um, but we can only do that if we do it together. So um, I think that's the piece we need to figure out is how can we make sure each and every citizen is equipped to make smart choices in the same way our businesses are trying to make smart choices. Thanks, Jody. Peggy, what about you? What do you know? What do you hope? Well, I know that the future is going to look different, right? Um, I we know that if there's hopefully once a vaccine is developed, it will start to normalize. But for the foreseeable future, it is going to look different. It might take some time, but we know that people will have to meet again. Travel is inherent in our DNA. Humans need to be around other humans. We've all said that. Um, this has taught us that. Right now, virtual is going to take the lead, and and obviously that's going to stay in place. There's going to be there's there's going to be more divisiveness, and that is clear because there are you know for everything Jody is saying. There, every time I see one point, I see 18 people saying the exact opposite. And I don't know how we make this work together because everyone is in the same storm, but they truly are all in different boats. And some people have different things they need to worry about. And, and when I think about the future of, of our business, it pales in comparison when I think about the future of humanity. And that's what really scares me right now because there's there, there I've never seen this much divisiveness ever in my nearly 50 planet and and I think that in order for us to be able to move forward to get to a point where this type of thing can be stopped before it starts we need to figure out how to get along and and I don't think there's anything else to say. We just need to figure out how to be kind to each other. Which was the same pre-pandemic, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So Sarah, same question to you. Um, I, I know for sure right now um, that we need to allow each other some grace and, and a little forgiveness in, in, feeling overwhelmed and stressed as we make these decisions based on information that is constantly changing. Uh, I know for sure from a business perspective that it's important for us to take a long view. Um, as, as Beth Ridley said in a webinar a couple of weeks ago, opportunities like this uh, and, and times of chaos like this, because this is so simultaneously the same, um, is, a, is a chance for good leaders to become great and great to become exceptional. And I think that um, it, I think I know for sure that that is going to happen in the next six to 12 months. Um, my hope is that as, as a complete population and to sort of echo Peggy's comments, you know, we can look at our business as individuals, but just as broader humanity. And, you know, even when I look at, um, you know, September is only 90 days away. What are my kids going to be doing then? And, and I just, it's not about me. It's global. It's affecting every one of us in our individual boats. And I, and I just, I hope that we can um, be a little more gentle with ourselves and with each other so that when we do get through to the other side, there's a little bit more calm and uh, we can just think clearly. Thank you, thank you all. 
Let's be kind to each other this weekend throughout the summer. Um, just a few last items before we let you go on to your weekend. If you had some questions that did not get answered from Peggy, Jody, and Sarah, and if you are a Tempo member or Emerging Women Leaders member, we invite you to sign up for our Tempo Talkbacks casual networking session on Zoom, which is on Tuesday, June 2nd from 4 to 5. So um, these have been really great, more intimate networking conversations, averaging about 10 to 15 people. So great chance to meet new faces and get to talk with our amazing panelists. And then I also want to plug our next two sessions. Note, like I said at the beginning, that the time is changing to the noon hour. Next Friday is a special Women's Affinity Alliance program where we will be talking about employee resource groups and diversity inclusion efforts. And then the following week, Friday, June 12th, we will be talking about what does life look like when we go back to the office. We're, and notice we didn't say back to work because we're all still working, but back to the office. So hope you can join us. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, be kind to each other, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Merit. Thank you. Bye.